Brought to you by Big Cookie Entertainment. He's muted again? You're muted. I... Go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode nine of Make Your Point. I am Adam Even. Uh, joining me on the show today are two of my very close friends. Uh, our first, our in-house JV quarterback, uh, Mr. Kenan O'Malley. Hey, guys. Oh, that's Zach. That. Oh, there's Kenan. Uh, as well as my uh, varsity water polo goalie co-host, Zachary Roisman. He's, he's muted. So... He's muted. You're muted. You're, you're muted, Zach. You muted me. I didn't mute myself. I yeah, you're supposed before. to unmute yourself. I, yourself. I tried. I tried, but Adam muted me again once I was ta- I in the, the middle of the, the actual, talking. I bet the actual Martin Scorsese would know how to unmute himself. I do, but he re-muted me in the middle of me talking. What a disgrace. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode nine of Make Your Point. I am Adam Maven. Joining me on the show today is our in-house JV quarterback, Mr. Kenan O'Malley. Hello. As well as our varsity water polo goalie co-host, my co-host, Mr. Zachary Roisman. Hi. Young Scorsese in the house. Shut up. You shut up. Uh, so, guys, uh, we're uh, way, uh, almost three months uh, uh, into quarantine so far. Um, you know, sports, <laughs> nice. sports is still finally uh, getting back. Uh, is they're slowly coming back. Kenan, you mentioned the Premier League. Uh, they're coming back. Um, June seventeenth. Uh, you said we're uh, not talking about that garbage I, on on this show. I know golf. Oh, I just mentioned it. We're not talking about it. Okay, I good. just said uh, uh, there's uh, other sports like uh, golf. I know tennis was discussing and, and other uh, leagues are discussing coming back and stuff. The German uh, Bundesliga has been back for two weeks now, and none of us care, like at Thank all. You. But. Uh, so the main uh, the main thing that has been in the news lately, uh, dealing with sports and whatnot, uh, is the NBA. Uh, the NBA has slowly been uh, been been coming up with a plan to return to uh, to action. Uh, they came up with a new target date, which is July thirty first, the end of July. That is hopefully when they can start the season. And Orlando has become a very serious possibility at ESPN's Worldwide of Sports, uh, where all the teams will be quarantined. Uh, there was a um, uh, Adrian Wojnarowski, the uh, NBA analyst for ESPN, he said that the NBA and the NBA Players Association are are working on a plan that would allow for a limited number of family members to eventually join players um, uh, when the season resumes in Orlando, like in the bubble environment. Uh, and Adam Silver, right now in the NBA, and uh, the the owners are currently uh, voting. Or yesterday, they actually voted um, on uh, a new uh, playoff format specifically for the season. Um, there were some teams on the cusp of just missing the playoffs or making the playoffs uh, a few games back. And um, players like Damian Lillard said, you know, if they're, if they're going to go straight to the playoffs or they're going to resume the season, I only want to come back and play with my team if we actually have a chance to actually uh, uh, make a run for the playoffs because we're in that nine seed and we could possibly make it into the playoffs. But they could just resume. But so Adam Silver, Adam Silver came up with a plan to have 22 teams uh, go to the uh, go go to Orlando. So because you don't want to bring those extra eight teams, where they people more there's a more of a risk of um, of catching COVID nineteen. Uh, so Zach, just tell me your thoughts on how you how you think this is uh, uh, this transition is going to be for the NBA, this new playoff format, and and bringing everyone to Orlando for this kind of bubble environment. Um, I think it'll play out well. Uh, you know, even though you you said no one cares. Um, the Bundesliga was one of the first sports, major sports leagues to resume action, and the way they have handled things has actually been incredibly impressive, um, even though uh, their situation over in Germany, a much more progressive country, is uh, has gone much better than, than uh, the way our cases have, have spun out. Yeah. Um, so it'll be a lot more risk involved for us, but uh, the NBA should know how, how to take things and how to uh, – make this transition as easy as possible. And I think they can handle that. 
Yeah, I definitely agree. I think Adam Silver is definitely, uh, uh, he is the guy among the, all the commissioners. He uh, has a great relationship with the players, the owners, everyone in, in, in the NBA. And I think everyone will definitely back his decision and doing whatever they can to possibly make a return to the NBA. Um, okay, so I'm ready to speak now. Um, go, go. So uh, I think it's great. Um, I think that the health of the players is very important, especially when it comes to their influence as, you know, famous people. Um, because there are so many people across the country and even, you know, young people, old people that see what their players are doing is like, oh, if they can, you, you know, go and be unhealthy, then so can I. But I think this way is a better way of doing it. If you have, you know, only 16 teams with only the necessary people there, then the risk of, you know, a, a virus spreading around is very low and it's a much safer environment. Um, to play, which I think is a good good idea of what not just the NBA should do, but I think that other sports could even look to the NBA. Um, you know, the NFL's, you know, it's still up in the air whether it'll be canceled this fall, but I think that if other sports can see how the NBA is successful, the NBA is much, you know, bigger, has a, a much larger um, uh, infrastructure than other sports like tennis or golf, as you mentioned. So for other really big sports like baseball, which no one cares about, or football, which people do care about, you know, it'll be good to look to the NBA and see how the NBA is handling the situation. Yeah, uh, for sure. You know, a lot of the owners and, and the players and, and executives, everyone in, in, in the league right now is, is so invested and everyone wants to get back to play, especially if they can do it safely. And I think the big question is among, among uh, uh the owners and the teams that are left out, you know, I, they don't want to be, um, they don't want to be left out and they, they want to go back and play, but uh, it, it's a matter of safety. Um, and I, you know, Mark Cuban, he, uh, he came out with a plan uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago about a way to resume the season. Um, and he suggested that uh, here, I'm going to read this the best that I can. I'm going to put it on the screen uh, afterwards, but uh, Mark Cuban's proposed plan to start the NBA season. All 30 teams play five to seven regular season games before before a play-in tournament for the final two seed, final two playoff seeds. The top 10 teams in each conference were qualified for the postseason and would be reseeded based on the record. Two play-in matchups pitting on pitting the 17th seed versus the 20th seed and the 19th seed versus the 18th seed. Play-in matchups could be single game or, or best of three series. Winners advance to play the 15th and 16th seeds for the final spots in the playoff bracket. So it's very confusing, but still, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of we play this, we play this, uh, this big play tournament so that they can eventually uh, make the postseason for teams like the Pelicans, the 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 Magic, maybe the the Trailblazers, the Grizzlies. These are all teams that are kind of on the bubble, the eight seed. You know that would that could if that, that this could benefit them. But teams like the Minnesota Timberwolves, the Golden State Warriors, the Hawks, the Knicks, the um, uh, I'm blanking. Uh, all those teams, they would be, uh, they would basically just be left out. I don't see a purpose for them to play uh, because it doesn't. Their, their record is so bad; they literally had no chance of catching up at this point. But his proposed plan was that all that was that thirty was that all thirty teams go and play. Uh, personally, I don't think that's the best decision, especially if it doesn't make any sense because you, for health reasons and you want to bring only the teams that have a chance to go. But you know, I, I think. Uh, people like D Damien Lillard, and uh, he's, he said it perfectly. He said, you know, I, I'm a team guy. I, I, I want to play with my team, but if there's no chance of us actually competing for anything, if we're going to go back and, and play three games just so, so that we have no chance of getting into the playoff, then what's the point? So, Kenan, do you think they should finish out the regular season, finish out those last 10 or whatever games they had so that these teams can make a push? Or do you go straight into the playoffs and, and create a much uh, a safer environment for everyone there? Uh, I think you go straight into the playoffs. I mean, um, you got to look at it in the way that you're already three months behind um, and finishing out the regular season, whether it be 10 games, 20 games, or one or two games, you're just adding to that, uh, adding to that, that ground you have to make up. Um, and if they, if the NBA has any interest in uh, keeping the original schedule uh, from years past, they need to go straight into the playoffs and, and get things rolling, get get the uh, finals rolling, get the off season, maybe shorten it, um, and get straight back into next season. Um, 
I agree with Kenan. I think that if you want to continue this season, you want to play, the goal is to finish the season and, to, you know, have the playoffs. The goal is to have teams compete against each other to win, to, to, to you know, get a trophy, to, to win, to get a ring. But for the teams that can't, why would you want to play? Why would you put yourself at risk? Why would the NBA – put, you know, more players, more teams, more families, more staff, more personnel at risk when there's really no reason for it to be done. Um, those teams, as, as Kenan said, they're not competing for anything. Why do they need to play? The goal is not for the NBA to just resume as normal because the situation is not normal. The NBA should be just resuming the best they can in the smartest way possible in order to achieve what the original goal is to achieve. The goal is not at this point for everyone to have fun. The goal is for a team to win and to still have the, the same, you know, excitement of the playoffs as you would have without the, the virus. Yeah. I think that if the NBA should return, I do believe that they go into the playoffs or maybe you have a couple of uh, like, I guess, pre-season games, I guess, like just exhibition games so that teams can kind of get back into it a little bit. Uh, uh, it, the reason they projected July 31st as the target date for the NBA return is because they want to uh, have a training camp and they want to have teams to practice because for uh, all, it, I get all, all these guys are obviously rich and they can take their private jet and they can fly across the country and practice with their teams. But for example, like, um, uh, it's not necessary. for example, uh, who, uh, Dwight Howard lives in Atlanta. He would have to fly all the way to, uh, Los Dwight Angeles. Howard's practice. opinion doesn't, doesn't mean anything. He would have to practice with his team in Los Angeles, then fly all the way back to Orlando. Trey Young lives in Oklahoma. He would have to fly down to Atlanta to, fly, to play with his team and then go to Orlando. And I think, uh, the traveling aspect, uh, they want to give teams that time to kind of get together, to play together, to kind of recapture the magic. But I do believe that a good thing about this whole, uh, this this time right now is that they can all um, uh, 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 stay in shape and they can work on themselves and they can stay healthy, which I think a lot of the guys are doing right now. And, you know, they're having their virtual off season. Speaking of virtual off season, I want to move into, <laughs> I want to move into uh, uh, the NFL. Uh, NFL virtual off season is something that is still happening right now. Although a lot of the NFL teams, a lot of the cities with the NFL teams are currently opening up their training facilities and their training camps. So Zach, talk about um, how you think this NFL return, the NFL, this off season right now is going to play out and how you think these teams are going to, um, how, the, how they're going to be affected right now uh, if the NFL hopefully returns next fall. Well, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be different, even if it's, you know, not as big of a difference, a big as a big of an effect as the NBA is, is, you know, having, but the NFL, it honestly needs to be different. That is a high, high contact sport and even training, even drills. Most of them are very high contact, a lot of sharing, you know, workout equipment and all of that. But I think that, you know, for the off season, if, you know, if everybody, if, if all personnel are required to actually quarantine and then, you know, they're limited to where they're going and they go to, you know, three places. They're allowed to go, you know, they're allowed to be at home. They're allowed to go to the store if they really need to. And they're allowed to go to, you know, their training facility. And that's that's it. And then, you know, you have most of what you need there. You're going to have most of the equipment there. You're going to have the players there. You're going to have personnel that's needed, doctors, that type of thing. So for the, the off season, as far as training goes, the NFL should be able to commence training as usual. Hopefully quarantine has gotten to a point by the time we reach next season that it will be safe. Although it's really not looking like it's going to be safe. And then also keep in mind that, you know, different cities are being hit, you know, some places harder than others. Yeah. Um, like Miami Dade and Broward have been hit a lot harder than some of the other cities. And, you know, um, and Washington state has been hit way harder than even, than even um, Miami has. So it's, it could be very difficult for teams to, to see what other teams are able to do. You know, a team like the Redskins may not be able to do the same level of training, the same level of, you know, season, the same level of normalcy as, um, 
the same level of normalcy as my what? Yeah, I know. No. No, I I know. Guys, there's 40 seconds Sorry. until lift off. What? There's 40 seconds until lift off. Okay. Uh, okay, what was oh. I saying? Okay, I'll be back in 40 seconds. 31, 30, okay. 29. Damn it, mom. All right. Zach, or, okay. So, oh, we're done. Uh, wow. Oh, should I continue? Okay, I'll yeah. be quick. Continue. Okay, um, yeah, Miami is getting hit, you know, not as hard as – the Redskins, so the Redskins may not be able to have fans in the stadium to the same degree that Miami or another city would, even though Miami probably wouldn't even be able to because Miami has still a lot of cases and the cases are rapidly rising. But we're, we'll have to see what happens, especially because, you know, you could have one game that if, you know, that one game could – we saw it with concerts at the beginning of this virus that, you know, after a bunch of concerts, it spread like wildfire and the same thing could happen and we would want to avoid that because it's better to have no fans get sick and have no fans in the stands than all fans get sick and now the fan base is all, you know, sick – or dead, which would be really bad and not good for the sport whatsoever. Awesome. Uh, Kenan is clapping because I assume the SpaceX launch, which just happened at the moment, uh, was successful. So good, America. Um, but uh, a couple things bef before we go here. More, so, uh, more things going on in the NFL. Um, Russell Wilson recently came out and said that he would love to have Antonio Brown on the Seahawks roster. Um, Antonio Brown has been practicing. He has been posting videos, uh, training videos in his my uh, friend in he's his my, Raider, in his Ra yeah in his Raiders helmet with his Steelers pants. Uh, no Patriots uniforms on or anything, but he's been um, uh, he's been practicing with Chad Ochocinco, uh, with Dwayne Haskins down here in Florida. Um, a couple uh, last week, he was hanging out with us on Whiteside as well. So he's with everyone, and he's uh, he's getting his work in, and, and he's and he's practicing. Kenan, do you think that a possible return um, by uh, Antonio Brown could be made in Seattle next season? Um, honestly, I have no idea. But Seattle looks like his uh, looks like the spot he will end up if he uh, makes his way back into the league. Um, and that'll be big for, uh, for Seattle. Um, I said before, if anyone can keep Antonio Brown in check, it's Bill Belichick, and uh, that didn't happen. Um, so I don't see as if uh, Pete Carroll can do any better. Right. Um, I don't see Pete Carroll really putting up with that. I yeah. just see, you know, Pete Carroll is a, a good coach, a, a very good coach. And even if Russell Wilson wants to, you know, have a great receiver on the team, which Antonio Brown is – I don't know if to P Carroll, it'll be worth it to have, you know, a screaming man baby on the team. <laughs> I, hold on, please hold him. Finding pictures uh, of me and my best friend. Another, You're upside down. I don't know if you know this. Yeah, I do know. He does know. Uh, another, uh, another kind of thing that, that went on this week is um, DeAndre ha uh, Everyone is throwing straight out Michael Thomas recently. Star receiver for the New Orleans Saints was in the running for MVP. Oh, yeah, he's been a big baby recently. Because his stats were insane. Devontae Parker got into it with him saying, if I had Drew Brees, uh, Drew Brees as my quarterback and was getting thrown 300 targets a game, I'd be awesome too. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins this week also said uh, that he is obviously the best receiver in the league. And if you the quarterbacks that he has had uh, in, in the past um, it, have just been awful. And I'm going to try and find the list right here. Um, if I can pull it up, but he's it, it, Kenan. I, I want to ask DeAndre Hopkins. Do you, do you think if Michael? Do you think Michael Thomas is a little bit overrated because all these other receivers are saying that they can do just as good if they had this quarterback? Here's the thing. Um, Michael Thomas is a great receiver, but there's no clear cut number two. Hold on, let me mute the live stream. Uh, there's no clear-cut number two on the Saints, and that will result in an incredible amount of targets. Now, you have to be good to put up those numbers in any fashion. Um, and in my opinion, to have the greatest quarterback of all time as your quarterback, it makes that easier. Um, but I agree with, with uh, every other receiver in the league, especially, you know, if Julio Jones was on the Saints, he would – annihilate every record that Michael Thomas set this season because he is the greatest receiver of all time. Yeah. Zach, what do you think about uh, everything that's been going on with, with Michael Thomas lately and DeAndre Hopkins? I mean, I wouldn't say that he's 
overrated. I'd say he's rated perfectly. But the other receivers do make a very good point. But at the end of the day, they say, oh, we could do just as good. But there's no way of actually knowing that. And you brought up um, DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins, I mean, he played with Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson's not a bad quarterback by any means. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's also a big part of it is if you're really that good of a receiver, you're going to do well with what you have. And I'm going to use Odell Beckham. Uh, I'm going to use Odell Beckham Jr. I don't know why I said it like that. I'm going to use him as an example. You know, he played with a very old and really not that great Eli Manning. Is Eli Manning a great quarterback overall in his career? Yes. But when he was throwing to Odell Beckham, he was, you know, really not that great. And Odell Beckham was still able to make plays every time because he took what he was given and he made lemonade, which Michael Thomas is doing the same. And I think that just because you have a good quarterback, I don't think it's fair to say that having a good quarterback makes you a worse receiver. I just think that it just means that you can't really – you can't – you need to, to give yourself a sort of handicap on those stats that, yeah, you, you, know, you have these incredible stats, but your quarterback has those amazing stats too because he's also amazing. Do I think Drew Brees is the greatest quarterback of all time? No. Yes. But is he a – no. But is, no. But is yes. he a fantastic quarterback? Absolutely. And I do think that most receivers, when paired with Drew Brees – would be able to do a lot just because he is that good. You know, even Ted Ginn, who was a mediocre receiver, was able to, you know, do fairly well. Um, but I think that well, he did okay. Um, but Julio Jones, he if he was paired with Drew Brees, I think that absolutely he'd be doing better than Michael Thomas. I think Michael Thomas has no room at this point to be considered one of the greatest receivers of all time. Yeah, But he's definitely one of the best playing the game right now, without a doubt. Well, here is uh, – well, let, wa- let me say one thing, Adam. Yeah. Um, while I do agree with most of what you said, um, and I'm not going to talk about how you were wrong about Drew Brees. He's um, not the best of all time. If you're, looking at, uh, if you're looking at Odo Beckham from, let's say, 2014 to 2016, uh, you have a very similar situation, even though Eli Manning definitely not as good of a – quarterback as, as uh, Drew Brees, um, but another situation where you have a clear-cut number one wide receiver and no number two. Right. I mean, Eli threw an incredible amount of footballs at, in, in Odell Beckham's mm. uh, direction through those three, four years, um, and that led to Odell's production. I mean, you see him join a team um, incredibly overhyped with, granted, a, a young quarterback – and, uh, but but a, but a talent, extremely talented roster, and his production drops tremendously. Right. Well, here I'll let me get in here for a sec. I want to read this list of quarterbacks um, that that DeAndre Hopkins has had. Um, at first, when I first uh, that's a great picture of Antonio <laughs> Brown, Zach. Uh, no, it's me. I, when, it's when me I, and Antonio Brown. Yes, I know. Best friends. When I first found, when I first looked at when I first heard of this this kind of beef with DeAndre Hopkins and and Michael Thomas. I, I was kind of thinking, like, was that a was that was, was he throwing some kind of like shade at at Deshaun Watson, saying how oh if I had Drew Brees I'd be the best quarterback and Zach's right by all means Deshaun Watson is a is a great quarterback uh, and he has a very bright future in the league um, but the list that the list of quarterbacks that Andre Hopkins had is not what pe- most people will remember he had these all these quarterbacks were before and during Deshaun Watson. Case Keenum, Matt Schaub, TJ Yates, Ryan Fitzpatrick, uh, Tom Savage, Ryan Mallett, Brian Hoyer, Brandon Whedon, uh, Brock Osweiler, Taylor Hineke, uh, and Brock and, Osweiler is better than Drew Brees. And then, and then Brock eventually, Osweiler, while he is a machine, is not Deshaun better Watson. than Drew Brees. So all those quarterbacks up until Deshaun Watson, Deshaun Watson ended up getting hurt. Uh, in his rookie year, he played like those first four games, right. and then he went out, and then the three quarterbacks that took that ended up taking his place were uh, Taylor Hineke, Tom Savage, and T.J. Yates. Now, honestly, all these quarterbacks uh, that I just named could, uh, if they if they had the tools, if they had the weapons, obviously they could they could probably make their own as an NFL backup. 
They're all per- they're they can they're all very average quarterbacks. Deshaun Watson is obviously higher than all of them. But looking at that list of quarterbacks and, and uh, listening to what what those names that just came out of my mouth, DeAndre Hopkins by all means is a way way talented receiver than those guys yes. quarterbacks. And uh, and maybe he has a point. Hopefully, being with uh, Larry Fitz and, and Kyler Murray, that offense might turn him into that or give him the stats that he's the receiver that he wants to be or show that he can have those stats like Michael Thomas. But, he, has, he has been amazing. His stats with those quarterbacks that he's had, his receiver grades, his stats, his yards right. per year, his receptions. His stats have, have are, without a doubt. Are, are amazing. But, Adam, also keep in mind that what you're pointing out with his going to a new team, what we've been talking about is, you know, Michael Thomas playing – with the absence of a great number two, Odell playing with the absence of a great number two, but going to the Cardinals, now he is going to have a strong number two. So we're going to see because having, you know, Fitz Dude, on his team, hurt. he could absolutely get way less targets than he would on another team. True, but Will, for example, Will, well, Fuller, Will, Fuller, was hurt. Offense. Will Fuller was hurt all the time, right? But when he did play, he had – 250 yards and three touchdowns, as we know from fantasy, because we all played Will Fuller eventually in fantasy, and it was the worst because he'd go off for 40 points every week whenever. He I don't remember that. Helped. No, that was but, you. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember that. Sorry, my experience, but uh, but Will Fuller would, would would take that away. But DeAndre Hopkins would somehow still end up with with 20 points just off of 10 receptions and and 100 yards, and and he and he was still just uh just amazing. Um, and I think that has that something has to be said there for the for that receiver who has played with that list of quarterbacks. Sorry, up until Deshaun Watson, uh, who was a great quarterback um, in Houston, and and honestly, I'm excited to see what he does. Um, I don't know why we're all doing this, uh, but um, what? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I just broke my computer. Uh, one thing. One thing I'll say is. Um, you know, you look at Michael Thomas, he's got an ideal situation. He's got the overwhelming majority of the targets being thrown to him. He's got a uh, Hall of Fame QB, easily Hall of Fame uh, quarterback, throwing majority of his passes in his direction. Yeah. And he puts up these these record stats, which, yeah, that makes sense. An above average wide receiver, a very good wide receiver, um, with, a, with an incredible quarterback throwing his way, throwing the majority of passes his way. Yeah. That makes sense that he has these stats. Yeah. Um, but there's also a situation. There's also situations like this, but uh, in the opposite. Like you look at Mike Evans, who to me is a top three receiver. Right. Um, with a god awful quarterback from last season. I mean, it's a fifty fifty chance from any football that Jameis Winston throws, whether it's going to be caught or intercepted. Yeah. Um, right. and, and Mike Evans still. His production, according to PFF, was seventh among all receivers. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if you put Mike Evans, you put a player like Mike Evans in, into that situation, or even Amari Cooper, who is thrown, who gets passes thrown from Dak Prescott, uh, Terry McLaurin, who's who, who was sixth rated by PFF. You put any of those receivers in that situation, and arguably they do better than Michael Thomas. Yes, and uh, you you brought up Amari Cooper. Uh, you brought up uh, Mike Evans, and I, I, I want to talk about uh, their their teams uh, for a second. The ESPN Football Power Rankings, or their Power Index uh, for the 2020 season, came out. Hopefully, the season will go on, and uh, these teams will be able to be in production uh, next season. But rankings one through 14 were listed, as well as number 32. I don't have 15 through uh, through 31 in front of me, but here, let me read this list, and we're gonna go. Let's see if we agree. Uh, number one, the Kansas City Chiefs. Right below them is the Baltimore Ravens. Three is the San Francisco 49ers. Four, the New Orleans Saints. Five, the Dallas Cowboys. Six, the Philadelphia Eagles. Seven, the Seattle Seahawks. Eight, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Nine, the New England Patriots. And ten, the Buffalo Bills. Uh, and then oh. 11, 11 through 14 are some wild cards. The Rams, the Steelers, the Vikings, the Colts are 11 through 14. And then all the way at 32 is the Jacksonville Jaguars, which I think anyone would have predicted. But 1 through 10, basically, the Chiefs, the Ravens, 49ers, Saints, Cowboys, Eagles, Seahawks, Bucks, Patriots, and then the Bills. How, to what extent do we agree? Is there one that should be misplaced or ranked higher? The, the Dolphins Eagles are top too 14. high. Zach, what, t- Zach, go ahead. Tell us uh, what you think is too high, what is too low, if it's right or not. 
Well, I certainly think that the Eagles are too high. I think the Buccaneers are way too high. I think that the Buccaneers are getting way overrated. I know that they're getting Gronk, and I know that they're getting Tom Brady, and I know that both of them are very old. And I know that Tom Brady's still talented, but in, and in past years he's just had a lack of weapons. But, and yes, he is going to now a, a team that he will have Gronk, and he will have Mike Evans, so he will have two very strong weapons. Chris but, Godwin, too. Right, and I, but I think that we should not forget that the Buccaneers, that's not their only issue. They are still not that great of a team. And now, you know, it's, this is a meme that I've seen several times where it's uh, Homer Simpson with the fat clipped behind his back. So he's like, in the front, he's all skinny, and he's like, yeah, and it shows, you know, Tampa Bay, great offense. And then you see from behind, yeah, but like this, this, this. They have so <laughs> many other issues. You know, I think that their defense is going to be a huge problem this year. Um, maybe not a huge problem, but I think it's going to be a, a, a big problem for them. I think that eight is too high. Do I think they're going to be terrible? No. But I definitely don't think they're going to be eighth in the league. I have them – I think they're going to do really? about equal to or worse no, than the Dolphins. Um, Who? And um, the Bucks are seventh oh, here. Oh, seventh. Okay, then seventh. I thought I heard Adam say eight. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, then the uh, the uh, the the, the, the Patriots. I think the Patriots oh, yeah. are too high. Also, I don't think the Patriots are going to do that well this season. I think that they were kind of carried by their defense this past season, and I think that I don't know how well that's going to work for them this year, especially now that they are, you know going against some teams that actually don't have a terrible defense. The Bills are a strong team, and I don't think that the Patriots are going to be able to contend. I think that's two losses for them right there, and I think that the Dolphins are going to beat them once, maybe twice, All right, so well, right uh, off the bat. Yeah, I d- definitely agree. We have a few minutes left, so let's get Ken in here real quick before we go. Ken, do you think any teams are too low or high uh, on this uh, ESPN power, f- football power ranking index for next season? Um, I, I'm going to say it. I think Kansas City is too high. And the only reason I to say that, um, while they do have the talent um, to make another Super Bowl run, it just never happens. You never see a right. team win the Super Bowl back-to-back. Um, and while that doesn't constitute them not being at number one, I think the the New Orleans Saints are the best team in the league. Um, I think um, the Ravens could have a shot at number one or at least the be better than – at least being better than, than the Chiefs. Um, there's a number of teams that can take over that number one spot. Um, I think the Chiefs can be placed anywhere in the top five, and you can make an argument for that. Um, I, I, think the, I think the Rams at 11 are too high. I think the Steelers should be higher, uh, higher than 12. I've, your list is outdated. Pennant, the Rams the are Colts, 17. Pennant, you picked the Colts to go all the way to the, uh, to the, champ, to the, to the championship or the, the Super Bowl, so I wouldn't be surprised uh, if you think the Colts should be higher as well. Uh, I think the, both the Colts and the Bills should be higher. Well, you have the season. Colts going to the Super Bowl? Yeah. All okay. right, well, we have less than a minute in this meeting. They have you an incredible defense, that. incredible I O-line, to, veteran I, quarterback, I, 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 I We don't should put some money on it. I, okay, we'll put my. Who do you? On that. Well, we'll okay, do, who we'll do you have? Discuss that another episode. Anyone other than the Colts? Off, so I don't have them winning it. I have them going there. I don't think they'll even. I definitely don't think they have a chance of going. Where, okay. where do you well, think they'll end up? We're done. So we will see you guys know, on episode 10, which was a very big milestone. Thank you for watching. Make your point, Zach, Kenan. Kenan, you are by far the most like uh, 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 continuing guest. Right one. I'm the most right. So right uh, thank you guys for show. watching, and we will see you yeah. soon. Apologies to our dear friend Shaquille O'Neal. Sorry we couldn't get you on the show this time, man, but we will try next week. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. And remember... The Golden Rule.